Hey everybody joining in this class on this Wednesday night through the uh, uh, means of electronic media. So we certainly appreciate that. <clears throat> We're still in the study of, <clears throat> of uh, Hebrews. We left off last time at Hebrews 11, chapter verse 28. So that's where we'll begin. Before we do, though, let's, let's have a short word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this day, for the time of our study, for the wisdom that we can gain from a diligent study of thy word. We pray, Father, that each of us may imbibe in the depths of thy word to learn its truth and to put those truths into practice. So bless us as we study. May we be better prepared for the master's use. We pray now that they'll continue with us and in our study, and may everybody gain something from this study. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> so we were in the uh, 11th chapter, which is sometimes called the uh, uh, Hall of Fame, uh, noted for those uh, worthies of old who uh, were noted for their faith. And I might just note that, uh, <clears throat> of course, faith is a uh, intimate uh, trust and confidence in God's promises. But here it's demonstrating that, uh, that more than just the confidence and, and trust in those promises, uh, their actions are related to that trust. The actions themselves prove that the trust and confidence was genuine. So we have here still talking about uh, Moses. <clears throat> Says by faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. Now the, the Passover uh, was an ordinance instituted by God through Moses. If you recall, the the uh, Passover reenacted the events of the deliverance from Egypt. It, it commemorated, of course, the passing over the Hebrews by the angel of death. And, you know, they, they were put blood above the lintel and when the angel of death saw that it passed over. And of course the Egyptians, they, you know, had no knowledge of that and they didn't do it. And so therefore the first one died. But it uh, educated the people in the knowledge and the worship of the uh, living, and, living and true God. And of course, Egypt was a uh, society of of idol worship and what have you. So uh, that was notable that that uh, these Hebrews worship a true and living God. But it's also typified the uh, sacrifice of Christ. And uh, we read in First Corinthians fifth chapter verse seven says, "Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump." since you are truly are unleavened. For indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. So if we've been washed with the blood of Christ, the angel of death passes over us. Uh, it, it was based on faith. You know, the Passover had never happened before. And uh, so when Moses had trust and confidence in God, and he acted upon it. So it was based on faith that Moses kept the... Uh, first, very first uh, Passover. In verse 29, <clears throat> it uh, reads, by faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. When the uh, Hebrews were trapped with the Red Sea to their front and the Egyptians to their back, uh, reason uh, determined that all was lost. But it was not to be so with uh, looking at it from the uh, faith. In Exodus, the 14th chapter, we have an account of, of what happened. And, and not only that, verse 16 says, lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea. And of course, uh, Moses did that. And the children of Israel were able, were able to go by, go by on the dry ground in the midst of the sea. The sea was a wall on both sides of them. But it wasn't the case with the Egyptians. 
and continuing on on in that chapter, verses 23, uh, verses 23 to 29. <clears throat> said the Egyptians pursued and went after them in the midst of the sea. Now it came to pass that the Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians to the pillar of iron heat, and he troubled the army of the Egyptians. Uh, so they had all sorts of problems, took off the chariot wheels, so they drove them in with difficulty. And, and of course, the, uh, the, the uh, Hebrew children walked across, and those wheels may have had difficulty in the sand. But anyway, they had uh, problems, and the Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fights for them and against the uh, Egyptians. Well, they were already in the uh, midst of the sea, so the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea, that the waters may come back on the Egyptians. And he did. And uh, the sea, sea returned to its full depth while the Egyptians were fleeing. So by that means, the Lord overthrew the Egyptians and the waters returned and covered the chariots and the whole army of uh, the army of Pharaoh. And there's not so much as one of them uh, that remained. <clears throat> but the children of Israel had walked on dry land in the midst of the sea. So they did this by faith. You know, they, they had never seen this happen before. And it had to be a lot of faith and trust in God to walk on the seafloor with a wall of water on either side of them. It took a lot of faith to do that. But to prove their faith, they had to actually do it. And they did. <clears throat> In verse 30, it says, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. <clears throat> we read about this in Joshua, the sixth chapter, verses three through five. You shall march around the city. You shall go around the city once. You do this six days, and then uh, seven priests shall bear seven trumps around the horn before the ark. For the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And uh, at the very last, they make a long blast, and then you hear, when you hear that sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout. And when they did that, the wall of the city uh, fell down. Now, there's really no logical connection between the shouting and the falling down the walls. Shouting is not going to cause a wall to fall down, not one as uh, robust as the wall around Jericho. But uh, reason aside, they did it. And faith was the only connection between the shouting and the falling down. So the, uh, the uh, Hebrew children did not use the usual instruments of warfare. But as Paul said in 2 Corinthians 10, chapter verse 4, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. And indeed, that's what happened to Jericho. <clears throat> in verse uh, 31 of Hebrews 11, <clears throat> by faith the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe, but she had received the spies with peace. Now, Rahab was a Gentile, and that should have said something to the Jews, but apparently it didn't. But she was a Gentile, and she had a, a, a practical faith in God. She was saved uh, from ruin and was elevated in the, the esteem of the Hebrews. You recall that she married Salmon, and she was the mother of Boaz, and Boaz begot Obed, and Obed begot Jesse, who begot David, through whom came the Christ. So at least one thing we can learn from this, it, it's of course the faith of, of Rahab, but the heavenly promise of salvation was for the Gentiles as well as the Jews, something that uh, Jews uh, didn't grasp. <clears throat> 
at the time. <clears throat> in verse 32, he said, what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David, David and Samuel and the prophets. Now, this was meant to be a concluding remark uh, on this uh, uh, panoply of faith. <clears throat> Now, of course, the names are not in chronological order, and it wasn't, wasn't intended to be. Gideon, of course, you recall Gideon is 300 uh, that subdued the, uh, the enemies of Israel. You remember Barak and the defeat of Sisera. You remember Samson uh, when he was called upon to perform great feats of strength. You remember Jephthah's rash vow and the sacrifice of his daughter. You know, David was always known for his trust and confidence in God. And Samuel was the last judge. And as a prophet of the Lord, he stands at the head of a long list of renowned prophets to follow. Now, these men were not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. They, every one of them had their weakness. But when it came time to demonstrate their, their great faith, they did so in trust and confidence by their works and proved it by their works. <clears throat> in the 33, the 33rd verse of uh, chapter 11, it says, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness. Uh, you might uh, refer to Acts 10 verse 35. The 35 said that in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. <clears throat> well, they worked righteousness, they obtained promises, that's the promised uh, blessings, and they stopped the mouths of lions, you may recall, David did that, and of course you could say that Daniel also did that. Now they did not necessarily do these things individually, that, well individuals did these things, but it's uh, more to demonstrate that a uh, that uh, as a class of men, uh, they were distinguished uh, for their faith in trusting God. <clears throat> in verse 34, uh, they quenched the violence of fire. <clears throat> well, you might uh, call to mind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's one that did. <clears throat> uh, they may have uh, escaped the edge of the sword, you know, saw try to kill David with the edge of the sword, but it didn't happen. And so they had a weakness, they were made strong, they became valiant in battle, uh, turned flight the armies of the aliens. And this is, of course, is a continuation of the list in verse 33. <clears throat> it's just, uh, of course, it continues on verse 35. Women receive their dead, raised to life again. You may recall the sons of the widow, uh, Zerephtha by Elijah. If you want to read that, you can. It's 1 Kings 17, verses 17, 17 through 24. <clears throat> uh, and then recall the Shunammite uh, widow that uh, was raised by Elisha. No, not the widow, but the son. 2 Kings, the fourth chapter, verses 18 through 37. Others were tortured, uh, not accepting deliverance that they may obtain a better resurrection. And if you read the uh, Apocrypha, you know, uh, talking about the Maccabean rebellion, there were examples there of those who would not accept deliverance and they were tortured. <clears throat> Verse 36, uh, still others had trials of mockings. Uh, of course, Phil, uh, Samson was mocked by the Philistines, and Jeremiah was also mocked. And scourgings, uh, it goes on to read, and scourgings, and yes, and chains and imprisonment. Uh, they were stoned, in verse 37, they were stoned, they were sawn into, they were tempted, sort of like Jesus was in the wilderness, and were slain with a sword. <clears throat> they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. <clears throat> he 
they did all these, uh, endured all these things because in the eye of faith they saw a better uh, homeland, a city made without hands. Verse 38, it said of whom the world was not worthy. And we talk about these worthies of old. They were in the world, but they were not of the world. So their examples of faith contrasted with the worldliness and of their contemporaries. And it goes on to read, they wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. So they endured a great hardship and trial, but it's all because by the eye of faith, they saw a better homeland. And uh, verses 39 and 40, uh, we see there the spirit of light and privileges of believers under the new covenant. And that's uh, what the writer is trying to demonstrate, demonstrate to his readers. <clears throat> Verse 39 reads, and all these, when we start from Abel onward, all of these having attained a good testimony through faith did not receive the promise. None mentioned that all these uh, uh, list of worthies lived to see the coming of the Messiah. But all of them believed in God as the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And through this faith that they uh, had, they accomplished many worthwhile and righteous things. They patiently endured the toils and tribulations of this life to obtain that promised heavenly rest. Yet none of them lived to see the fulfillment of the promise relating to the coming reign of the Messiah. In verse 40, <clears throat> that God having provided something better for us, and that's the new and better covenant, having new and better promises, which the patriarchs saw through the eye of faith, as uh, Abraham said about Abraham in John 8, chapter verse 56, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and saw it. He saw it and was glad. <clears throat> But none of them saw it as we now see it. Now that's not part of the John. I'm just saying none of these worthies of old saw. Uh, they, they, they didn't see what we now see. So we're in a much better position. As Christ said, uh, where I tell you that many prophets and uh, kings have desired to see what you see and, ha and have not seen it. And to hear what you hear and have not heard it, that comes from the 24th verse of Luke 10. So God provided something better for us. <clears throat> and of course, uh, the writer was speaking to the Hebrew Christians there, but he's also speaking to us. That they should not be made perfect apart from us. Uh, talking about us, that's the Hebrew Christians to whom the epistle is addressed. <clears throat> and this apart from us, you know, we can we can read in Romans uh, third chapter, verse 25, then God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously uh, committed. So we're all been made perfect together. The ancients could not be made perfect absent the cleansing of the blood of Christ. So all are made perfect by that blood, uh, which binds together the saints of all ages. <clears throat> In uh, chapter 12, <clears throat> you, you might think of uh, what is said there as kind of an allusion to the Grecian games. You know, Grecian games were very popular in the Roman world at that time, including Palestine. You know, I think there are a number of arenas or stadiums in Palestine where they uh, held these games. <clears throat> <clears throat> so this is kind of an allusion to that. In verse one, it says, therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud, 
and it's kind of a metaphor for a large, tightly packed uh, crowd. <clears throat> uh, and that's been re uh, referred to in past in, in Ezekiel 38, chapter verse 9, and verse 16. Said, the verse it says, you will ascend, coming like a storm, covering the land like a cloud. It's, of course, that's a metaphor. You and your, all your troops and many people with you. In verse 16, he said, you will come up against my people, Israel, like a cloud. <clears throat> Not a virtual cloud, but a, 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 a metaphor to cover the land. <clears throat> so this greater cloud is a metaphor for a large, highly packed crowd. He said, by so great a cloud of witnesses, the witnesses are these worthies of old, just uh, enumerated in chapter Eleven plus there, there are probably many more that are not named. <clears throat> this uh, word witnesses occurs quite often. It occurs 31 times in the uh, New King James New Testament. I didn't check the uh, other versions. It's uh, translated 31 times as witnesses and three times as martyr. <clears throat> and one time as a record. And witnesses uh, mentioned here, uh, that long dead, not physically surrounding the Hebrew Christians, addressed, uh, addressed, and the Christian dressed, they're not physically there observing the conduct, but in a very real sense, they are uh, observing what the, these Christians, the Hebrew Christians are doing. <clears throat> And of course, uh, these Hebrew Christians tell these witnesses, if you will, in, in high regard. So if Abel being dead could still speak to them, <clears throat> then these worthies long dead could serve as witnesses of the conduct of the ones addressed here. And these Hebrew Christians had to keep that in mind. <clears throat> these witnesses are examples to follow whose conduct the Hebrew Christians uh, are to emulate. Therefore, they are saying to the Hebrew Christians, that that's the uh, witnesses, and to us too, if we could remain faithful in the face of all our trials and temptations, which are many, then you, the Hebrew Christians, and we living today can do the same. So it's, it's certainly an encouragement to us <clears throat> so it goes on to read in this uh, verse one, we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Uh, so let us lay aside every weight. <clears throat> and again, harking back to the, uh, the illusion of the Grecian games in the amphitheater, uh, runners in the races or whatever uh, competitor, whatever competition they're in, they would lay aside anything and everything that might impede their speed in the race or their advantage in the contest. It says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so, so easily ensnares us. Now that's the uh, sin of unbelief, which will result in apostasy. Now that's a problem every generation of God's people, even Christians today have when they need to avoid you know, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and pride of life. All those things draw our minds and hearts from God and make us trust more in the creature than in the creator. <clears throat> and again, uh, talking about the uh, metaphor, it said, let us run with endurance, that's patience, uh, perseverance, uh, this is encouragement to persevere through all trials and tribulations, which are going to come to the faithful. It's bound, it's, it will happen. This run with endurance, the race, that's the Christian race, that is set before us. And uh, this uh, race set before us represents uh, presently and prospectively our efforts to reach the goal of the victory and the Man of life. <clears throat> <clears throat> it 
And here in verse uh, uh, two, it said, looking unto Jesus, the author. Um, an author is one who leads or acts as a principal in any given enterprise. So he's that one. And finisher, <clears throat> it only occurs here. It doesn't occur anywhere else. Now that's the, uh, the completer, the one who completes, the one who perfects, uh, the one who brings a scheme or enterprise to his full and perfect consummation. So Jesus, the author and finisher of our uh, faith. I might just add that uh, our is a word supplied by the translators. If you look at the Greek, it just says of faith is the author and finisher of faith. But by implication, it's talking about our faith. So the, that's, that's, of course, the uh, faith, the system of faith, the gospel, uh, the faith once delivered. <clears throat> who for the joy, uh, that's uh, talking about Jesus's joy, his zeal for the glory of God and the salvation of mankind, that was set before him. He and no other could accomplish the, the uh, design of deity for the salvation of mankind. If he didn't do it, it wasn't going to get done. So that was set before him. He endured. Uh, endurance is, of course, the fortitude from beginning to end. He went through the whole process of crucifixion. He endured the cross. Now, the cross is not a piece of jewelry to, to be worn as some sort of uh, symbol of one's spiritual condition. I see that uh, quite often either around the neck or what have you, and that doesn't uh, move me one way or the other. It doesn't tell me anything about the person, or their faithfulness, or anything. It's just a piece of jewelry. But the cross here is not that piece of jewelry. Historically, it's an instrument of torture. Uh, it was a shameful punishment uh, of the lowest and most vile order. Said he endured the cross, despising. Now that comes from two Greek words meaning to think, think against evil. Uh, so that's it, it means sort of the holding the contempt or think lightly of. He, he certainly knew that the, what the cross, you know, being crucified meant is going to be a very painful. But in the context of things, he held that in contempt. He didn't think uh, uh, highly of it, thought lightly of it. He said, despising the shame, uh, the shame he willingly submitted to all the sufferings and reproaches of the cross. It was a shameful thing to be uh, crucified. And as a result, he uh, has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So the writer here is exhorting them to to run the race, not only as if in the presence of the worthies of old, but while doing so, to keep in mind or in view the author and finisher of their faith, namely Jesus. In verse uh, three, <clears throat> for consider him, this Jesus, uh, who considered who endured such hostility in, in the King James says contradiction and gainsaying in, in the ASB. It comes from the word, uh, Greek word antologia, which means to speak against. So opposition by means of words and arguments. Uh, it's a rebellion against authority. Uh, the words deal, did give rise to action. So he endured such hostility from sinners against himself, uh, consider him, lest you become weary. That's weary from running the Christian race and discouraged in your souls. When the soul is bowed down under the uh, manifold trials and tribulations of, the, of this life, 
Looking under Jesus dispels discouragement. By doing so, Paul could then say that he rejoiced in his sufferings, as he said in Colossians, the first chapter, verse 24. I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. In verses 4 through 11, he encourages them to bear their trials and afflictions with patience. He said in verse 4, you have not yet resisted the bloodshed striving against sin. Well, sin is uh, here personified. So that's the sin in others and sin in ourselves. <clears throat> and uh, the strivings of the Hebrew Christians against sin in themselves are the oppressors. Uh, that is the enemies of truth. That had not yet resulted in the shedding of their blood. Paul strove against sin as he wrote in 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, verse 27. But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should uh, become disqualified. Now, the striving against sin is not a passive condition, but it's an active one. The Christian cannot strive against something that he cannot recognize. Therefore, study this to show their self-approved, rightly dividing the word of truth. So it takes a study, a diligence to be approved. And we must uh, rightly divide the word of truth. I always say that if you can rightly divide the word of truth, you can wrongly divide it as well. <clears throat> In the fifth verse of chapter 12, the writer says, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. Now, of course, the whole purpose of uh, Hebrews was to exhort them to faithfulness, not to abandon faith and go back into Judaism. So the only reason that they had forgotten was that they were negligent in their uh, study of God's word and the discharge of their Christian duties. Uh, many may have been striving earnestly for the faith once delivered to the saints, but enough had not, which is the occasion for this writing. <clears throat> it speaks to you as sons, ones loved as a father loves his son. It says, goes on to say, my son do not despise the chastening. Now that's the chastening as a father would correct and discipline a son. Now, I know all you sons out there, you have fathers, can recall the chastening that you received. I can, I can certainly remember it. <laughs> both ends, both, both directions. He said, do not uh, despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. So God is dealing them with uh, dealing with them as children whom He loves, and this uh, comes from Proverbs third chapter verses eleven through twelve. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest His correction. For whom He loves, the Lord loves, He corrects, just as a father the son in whom He delights. So he's bearing, uh, urging them to bear their afflictions with patience. <clears throat> In verse six, he says, for whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every man, uh, every son whom he receives. Now, the fact that, the, uh, that God even bothers to chasten them or us, for that matter, proves his love for them and for us. And, you know, he could have just ignored them, just, uh, just let them go about their business and not tried to correct them. So that proved his love towards them. <clears throat> In verse seven, it's, but it says, if you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? What son does not endure chastening? 
Well, all sons have done that. And that's really a sign of being a son. In verse eight it said, but if you are without chastening of which all have become partakers, and that is certainly true, then you are illegitimate and not sons. I might add that there are some fathers that uh, have uh, neglected to chasten their sons and it's been to the great uh, harm of the son. So a father that loves his son is going to see that uh, their character and, and uh, personality are uh, developed in an appropriate way. And one of the ways of doing that is through chastening. So it says if you, didn't, if you don't have chastening, then uh, you're illegitimate, illegitimate and not sons. So rather than complaining about the discipline of fathers upon the sons, the Hebrew Christians should rather view that as proving that they are the legitimate children of God. They need to think of this in a different light. And, and for that matter, so should we. <clears throat> in verse 9, furthermore, we have had human fathers. In the King James and ASV says fathers of our flesh, of course, means that flesh is human flesh. Same thing. We've had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Shall we? And of course, we all recognize this as a. Uh, as uh, a valid uh, statement, shall we not much more readily be in sub subjection to the Father of Spirits and live? Yeah, the word Father in both cases, human fathers and Father of Spirits, implies uh, origin and guardianship. You know, like produces like. Uh, Genesis, the fifth chapter, verse three, it says there, and Adam lived 130 years and got a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. And in John 8, chapter verse 39, they answered and said to him, Abraham, our father, is our father. And Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. You know, life produces life. And in John 3, chapter verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit like produces like. <clears throat> now, human fathers in their corrections uh, make errors, uh, but you know, we still respect them. <clears throat> I can't think of a time that I really deserved the correction from my father, but I took it anyway. I respected him for it. And uh, of course, I tell people that ruined me forever. I still show respect for my elders and uh, for others and, and you know, tend to my responsibilities and what have you. So that, that, that just ruined me. But anyway, their uh, correction, the correction of human father is going to eventually end. I don't have a human father anymore uh, living. So how much more we should respect the chastisement of the one who never errs and his chastisement is for our ultimate good. And he always has our good in mind throughout our lives. And his correction and care for us will never end. He's always there, always will be there. In verse 10, for they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, and it's a judgment, Chastening to human, uh, human fathers is judgment. But he for our profit, and he doesn't, uh, he does it for our best, and it is for our best, that we may be protectors of his holiness. Again, for emphasis, the fathers of the, of the flesh chastise according to the limits of human knowledge and as it seemed best to do under the circumstances. But God, our Heavenly Father, chastises perfectly for our internal, eternal good and by such correction qualifies us to be partakers of his holiness. He never leaves nor forsakes us. 
He forever watches over us and corrects us as necessary. For he, he wants us to be holy as he is holy. He said on numerous occasion, occasions, be holy for I am holy. <clears throat> now, verse 11, now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. I can attest to that. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. I just have to ask, you know, who likes chastisement? Uh, chastisement produces pain of some sort, maybe physical or emotional, but its intended objective is a more mature person. Spiritually, it produces righteousness as its fruit. The fruit may be, may only be enjoyed later, but nevertheless, it is there. But this is available to those who are trained by it and do not resent the chastisement. And in that resentment, they rebel against it. Just as the athlete was trained and trained and trained to compete successfully, so must the, must the Christian be continually trained by the chastisement of this life. King David said in the 119th Psalm, verse 67, before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I keep your word. And then the uh, 70, 71st verse there. But it is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. So, you know, chastisement is good. Uh, and not that we like it, but it does develop us, make us more, become more uh, mature, either as uh, humans in society or in our Christian lives. So we should keep that in mind. Since we're a little bit over time now, we'll stop here and we'll start again next week with verse 12 of Hebrews chapter 12. Thank you for your kind attention.